Okay, I will bring into session the uh, meeting of the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee for the Town of Corner Madera for Monday, November 14th. Uh, meeting is in person, but also we have video teleconference. Um, so maybe I want to do roll call. Sure. Can we do that? Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kirby Bartlett. Here. Shara Longanati. Here. Uh, Tom Nossiger. Bob Ravazio. Here. Mark Madden. Tony Garza. Here. And David McPherson. Here. Thank you. And if you join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the public for which it stands. Okay. So uh, we now have open time for the public. Any a member of the public who wishes to comment on something that is not on the agenda. Now is the opportunity to do so. I don't see any, are there anybody online who wants to uh, comment? We have two virtual attendees, neither have their hand up. Okay. And no emails. No emails, thank you, Chris. Yeah. We will close public comment and we will move on to item three, approving the minutes of the July 11th meeting and the August 8th special meeting. Um, sent the, is there anybody who has any changes to the uh, minutes? Oh, and that's page two. See that, Patty? Yeah. Near the bottom, Patty. Okay. Okay. Um, is there a motion to accept with that change? Yes. Accept. A second? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No? Okay. Then we'll approve the minutes. Are there any committee members who have a report? Oh, I thought I was doing both at the same time. Oh, okay. That's all right. You okay with that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, any member of the committee have any reports for this evening? Um, Bob, uh, David McPherson here. Uh, not so much a report, but just a question about the three-foot banners. It's not clear to me um, whether or not we have settled on dates that those would be uh, installed and for how long and, and if it's appropriate, maybe we can get, if RJ knows what's, what's gonna happen with those three foot banners. Um, I believe a round of them went up and um, we'll have to go to the staff report and reference the dates of subsequent rounds, but um, we can follow up with that information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Committee members? No? All right. Uh, presentations. We have a presentation from the Marine County Bicycle Coalition. Uh, progress update on e-bike education. I believe this is virtual. Yeah. Hi, yes. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me share my screen here really quick. All right, is everyone able to see my screen there? Yes. Yep. Wonderful. All right, um, hi, my name is Zoe Reckes, Advocacy Assistant with the Marin County Bicycle Coalition. And I'm here to share just a quick update on one of our latest programs, eBike Smart Marin. So actually, I think I'm on the wrong side. Nope, oh, there we go. All right. So as we know, um, e-bikes are a relatively new technology, and they offer a pretty exciting opportunity um, as far as removing barriers that stand in the way of reliable, equitable, 
and environmentally conscious transportation for a wide range of people in our communities. Um, there's a lot of people who may be interested in riding their bikes more, but maybe they don't because they have a longer commute or they live in an area with really steep hills. They're worried about how long it might take them to ride their bike or getting to school or work looking sweaty and unprofessional, um, as well as general traffic and safety fears. Um, there's also a lot of people in our communities who don't have a car. This might be because of their age, financial restrictions, um, or even environmental concerns. With the climate crisis, we're seeing more people interested in going car free. So that's just a few of the barriers that e-bikes help to remove, but really at the end of the day, um, electric bikes can help to reduce traffic emissions and congestion, as well as increasing mobility for a wide range of people in our communities. However, as we've all seen, um, e-bikes don't come um, without their own challenges. So. Um, as we've seen a growing number of e-bikes on the road, we've also seen an increase in conflict between different road users, um, whether that's bikes, pedestrians, cars. Um, we've also had more communities reporting growing safety concerns, particularly, particularly with um, students and teen riders on e-bikes. Um, the growth of e-bikes has been very rapid and in a lot of ways has outpaced current policy, education, and infrastructure. We're also getting a lot of specific concerns. Oops. There we go. I'm um, getting a lot of specific concerns about the speed of e-bikes um, that can come into play, particularly with the class three bikes that can go up to 28 miles an hour. Um, and then specific concerns regarding the class two e-bikes and their throttle function. So all of this is to say that we at MCBC kind of started noticing this gap between all of the potential benefits that e-bikes are able to offer our communities and then the challenging reality of actually trying to integrate this new technology within our communities and existing infrastructure. And so this is all what led to the creation of eBike Smart Marin. And this is a multifaceted program that focuses on education, outreach, and safety. So we'll be implementing and coordinating a teen eBike safety program um, to educate and reinforce the use of safe e-bike riding practices, as well as developing and teaching classes, um, as well as offering group rides for older adults that allow them to enjoy um, the mobility and community benefits of e-bike transportation. We'll also be conducting outreach with families and community members about the expanded commuting capabilities and low environmental impact of modern electric bikes and hosting test rides for community, community members, elected officials, and agency staff to offer firsthand experience to help promote the benefits and possibilities of electric bikes. As this is a very new program, um, we're kind of focusing on our teen safety program first and foremost. That's really based on the community feedback that we've been getting from all over Marin County. So with this teen safety program, we're gonna be working very closely with the Safe Routes to School team. They have a great group of instructors that are all league certified through the League of American Bicycles. Um, this curriculum that they're developing is going to include both classroom presentations as well as on bike skills practice so that students can really get comfortable um, on their electric bikes before they're really just thrown out there on the streets with all sorts of other traffic and road users. And we're really trying to focus on safety through developing a really deep understanding and respect for rules of the road, especially since a lot of our younger riders might not have a driver's license yet. And so they haven't had that experience as far as sharing the road. 
We're also focusing on competency in bike handling and emergency maneuvers. E-bikes do have a different handling compared to a standard bike. So again, we wanna really highlight the on-bike skills practice for our students. And then also just highlighting the value of respecting other road users, um, whether that's other people on bikes, pedestrians, or drivers. And we're hoping to launch this program in January of 2023. And as of right now, we are on track for that launch date. So that's kind of my main update for now. Um, the other aspects of that program will be rolling out soon after this teen program. But again, that's our main focus for the time being, just based on community feedback. Um, so I wanted to put up my email there. I'm always available if anyone wants to get in touch with me directly. And then that's a link um, to our e-bike webpage. At the bottom of that, there's a form to sign up for updates as we roll off this program so people can stay in the know. Okay, thank you, Zoe. Uh, so first off, are there any questions from BPAC members for Zoe? You have one, Cheryl? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Zoe, will... Um, oh, Cheryl, Mike, uh, Mike, please. He has to be on green. There oh, go. there you go. Um, Zoe, will um, the classes for teens be offered through the schools, like through Safe Routes to Schools, or will they be uh, offered separately, like on Saturdays and, and like other programs MCBC has offered? Um, at present, they're likely going to have to be offered separately just because of funding. Um, we're going to have to charge for these programs um, in order to cover all of our costs. Um, and so because of that, we can't offer it directly through the schools. And is there any component of it that does outreach to parents? Because I think parents don't recognize, um, I mean, kids as young as five years old, eight years old can ride and, and buy a, a an electric bike and they may not be that may not be appropriate for someone that age. So is there something, a component that that addresses the parents? Absolutely, yes. Um, so that's gonna be a big part of this teen program and just e-bike Smart Marin in general is really working with parents and educators and any adult who is involved in this process because there is a lot of misinformation out there and confusion about who is able to ride e-bikes or what types of e-bikes they might be able to ride. So yes, um, we will definitely be involving parents because they know their students um, and their capabilities better than anyone. Any other questions? No. I think David also has a hand up. Yeah, hi Zoe. Zoe, are you yeah. um, the assistant to Warren Wells? Yes, I work directly under Warren. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. And please thank Warren as well for responding. Um, I recognize that uh, you all met for a day to work up a curriculum for e-bikes. Were Central Marin Police Authority or Mill Valley Police Department involved in working on that curriculum? So we're still very early in the development of this program. Our next internal meeting is actually this week. Um, and getting local police departments is one of my top priorities. Um, so we don't currently have that relationship set up with them, but I am wanting to establish something with them before the program rolls out. Um, has the Marin County Bicycle Coalition have... Uh any outreach to the e-bike manufacturers to see what uh, resources and contributions they can provide, including financial contributions and or curriculums that they have perhaps already done so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So bike manufacturers aren't really gonna be putting together any kind of curriculum. We are wanting to work with the League of American Bicyclists um, so that they can help develop a nationwide curriculum. Um, but so far, they haven't developed anything in that sphere yet. Um, so this is all quite new. We're kind of on the leading edge, which is exciting in many ways. Okay. Finally, um, 
I would encourage you to continue to use Nextdoor <clears throat> as a resource to communicate with the community that is not necessarily on the MCBC uh, website or, or email list. Because as you know, uh, Nextdoor you know, is the place where people go to vent their concerns and their frustrations. And I think I counted in, in just three posts that there were over 200 people who responded who were pretty outraged about the way younger people were, were riding their e-bikes. So each step of the way that you are, are getting closer to being really able to um, re release this uh, e-bike curriculum, I, I think that you should use a next door to make sure the community knows that you're, you're making progress. Absolutely, thank you. Thank we're still you. doing questions. Are there any other questions from the committee members? No, then we'll open it up to the public. If there's any questions from the public or comments, please come to the microphone. If you can give your name and where you live. Hi, Jean Severinghouse. Let's get the microphone on. Hi, Jean Severinghouse in um, the Green Bay Boardwalk in Cordomandera Sphere of Influence. And I'm wondering if um, the Bike Coalition has worked with the California Highway Patrol, who I've been told several times are developing this curriculum and the regulations or the laws or whatever they want to share statewide. Thank you. Yes. Um, so that's another very new development. Um, so the CHP, I don't have an exact answer for you yet um, because it's such a new development, but we have reached out to our local contacts with the CHP and we're trying to get in contact with someone higher up so that we can work with them in that development, either as they are developing their own program or so that we can help them develop it. Um, how that exactly works out is still to be determined, um, but we are in connection with them. Thank you. Uh, we will bring it back to the BPAC for comments. Any comments? Um, I have one. Um, Cheryl, thank you so much for sending the link to the Mill Valley meeting um, where they talked about this because this has become, as David mentioned, a serious issue on next door neighborhoods. We're hearing a lot about it. And apparently uh, CMPA is writing lots of tickets on this to younger people, uh, but the district attorney's office throws them out if they're juveniles, uh, nothing they can do. So what, and they're, uh, they had a meeting with the uh, Bay Area Risk Poll, which is like 20 different communities that are all tied together for insurance, we're one of them. And they talked about this there. And one of the suggestions that I'm going to suggest we pursue as well uh, is to follow what we did for the social host ordinance and apply it to e-bikes. So this is just going to take a minute, but the social host ordinance is, applies to teen drinking. And we passed this, I don't know, maybe eight years ago um, and got other communities to do it as well, where we hold, if there's a party at a house and there's alcohol consumed by young people, we actually hold the parents responsible. And we find the parents and, you know, if there's a second offense that the fine increases. Um, but taking that as an example, uh, we can apply it to e-bikes. And um, the idea is potentially to pursue something where parents are, uh, you know, cited as well as the child if the child is found speeding, because that seems to be the big problem is kids are just speeding in e-bikes and you know, on sidewalks and through lights and everywhere. Uh, but the child gets cited and the parents get cited and the parents have to attend a class with the kids on safety for e-bikes, which would take some time. And that would be for the first offense. And then the second offense maybe would be a fine and maybe another class that's longer. So um, I talked to Todd Cusimano about this for a while today because this is what they're pursuing in Mill Valley. And I think it sounds like an interesting idea. Uh, and it sounds like one that might actually have some effect uh, on parents if they suddenly have to sit through a three hour class because you know the child was you know, running stop signs. So I just wanted to pass, put that out there and see what, what you guys think about it. If you think it makes sense or something to, because I can recommend to the town council that we all agree on it and that we should you know, take a strong look at it if Mill Valley is. I, I uh, well, 
I think it's a good idea. It was actually when I was thinking of when when I forwarded the um the link to the video of the meeting in in Mill Valley where it was discussed. Um, yeah, I I think parents are are a, um, they're a link in the chain here, and um, to have more parental responsibility so, because it's it seems obvious to me. Kids are riding bikes that I don't throttle bikes. And going really fast, and they, 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 we can't expect kids to know what what could happen to them. Right. I mean, and so the parents have to take responsibility. Any comments from BPAC or members? Yeah. This is Bob, I I was really pleased to hear that you're a few steps ahead on thinking about what can be done locally, legislatively, and I completely support that. And I'd like the everybody to weigh in on that so that you can report back to the town council. One of the points that I was going to make is absent some sort of punitive measures. And my thought uh, was that if a teen is, you know, 12, 14, 15, and gets two or three citations, that uh, that should, in my mind, at least have an effect on their ability to get a driver's license when they're 16. Now, I appreciate that that would be state legislation rather than something that we could do locally, but your idea about something similar to the, the social host uh, ordinance that, could, that would be enforced by the district attorney and be enforced by our local authority, I think is, is brilliant and uh, absent something like that uh, I, I don't think, uh, well, it just puts real teeth into the curriculum that uh, the Marin County Bicycle Coalition and the, and the lessons and education that they will provide. It'll put teeth into that, um, that education. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think if a parent suddenly finds they have to spend three hours on a Saturday in a bike class, um, yeah, I think we'll start to get some attention. <laughs> Should we get my attention? Kirby. Yeah, um, I just want to say I, I really like the concept. Um, Bob, I think it's a creative um, solution. After all, um, most of the kids that have e-bikes, my guess is the person that bought it is their parents. <laughs> yes, um, and I will just say that this is an idea that we have discussed as far as how we want a partnership with local PDs, um, you know, maybe making people go through one of our classes if they are issued a citation so that they don't have to pay the fine or something like that. Um, because I agree, we do need some sort of enforcement. Otherwise, it's just talk in one year and, and out the other. I'm going to come at another angle and just just say it seems like that might be too soon. I think the flooding of uh, education, you know, uh, should happen very strong first. I think it's great, Zoe, what's, what you're introducing and such and giving parents a chance to learn. Because I think this is a, it's a new thing. <laughs> it's a very new thing, you know, and, and it, it's going to be uh, maybe thinking too far ahead, it's going to be hard to control it, even with, you know, citations and such, and it might have a bigger backlash, you know, or uh, from it happening too much control. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just the, the flooding of education and, and, you know, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's hard to swallow. You say, oh, now I got to go spend three hours. Well, I th everybody needs to spend 30 minutes or, or whatever this you know getting up to speed on it so to speak I think should happen at a at a great scale at a huge scale well apparently if this helps um CMPA is writing more citations on this than anybody in the county the DA just throws them out nothing happens yeah because they're for I mean so there's yeah. there's literally no effect so we're trying to figure out something that people will actually pay attention to and will have some effect and, and create change because right now they literally just toss them. It doesn't matter how many you get. I mean, you can get one every day. Bob, do we know why they're being thrown out? Is it the DA won't pursue uh minors would, or something like this? Oh, because they're because they're minors. They're minors. Yeah. 
So yeah. is, Bob, as far as you know, it's not because uh, some statutory effect, in other words, if you don't have a driver's license and you get a citation for speeding or reckless, then maybe, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna inquire directly to the DA. She's, she's been responsive to other emails, but I'd like to understand better what it is that prevents her uh, and her assistance from from uh, prosecuting or or doing anything about it. It may be because they don't have a driver's license, which is exactly then why you need a local ordinance. What is, what is the enforcement that's happening? Like if you look at the Mill Valley Mill Valley multi use path, and the you know there's always been the issue of cyclists speeding and creating da dangerous situations for families and kids and, and such. What is the, is there any type of enforcement that's happening uh, there? I'm not sure the status, if there's a problem, you know, they will write a ticket and they will enforce it. I mean, I know they do that. I don't know how many they do or how long. I mean, I don't yeah, know. But the point there would be that if, if an adult or at least a person with a driver's license gets a citation for a violation of the California Vehicle Code while on a bicycle, that's can be enforced and will be enforced. Whereas I guess the, the issue about uh, minors is perhaps creating a problem. I'm just curious how that, how that, is, how that has moved along, you know, it's because they've come a long way. There's a lot more, I guess, signage or awareness to the issue. And it's, you know, it's a lot better than it used to be. Yeah. So uh, there might be a parallel path you know, educating on this subject. Okay. I'll pass everybody's comments on to the town council for tomorrow night's meeting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's my meeting tomorrow night. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Zoe. Appreciate it. Um, I think we can move on from this item to item 6A, trails along the bay, who owns land and maintains them? RJ and Chris, this must be you. Yep. Yep. Um, okay, just give me one sec to pull this up. Okay, so yeah, this was a question that came up in the last meeting. So, um, so this image was pulled from the climate adaptation assessment and shows um, all the landowners along the bay. And um, I drew in roughly where the trails are that go along the bay. Um, and so each landowner maintains the trails on their respective land. And the town only maintains the unpaved trail on the north end of Shorewood Marsh, which is this section. Um, and then the uh, class one path along San Clemente Drive, although that's paved, so kind of a different situation there. Um, and then uh, I think this is block. So the, the landowners um, that own most of this area are the Golden Gate Bridge District, which is um, this area right in the middle, uh, the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit or SMART. Um, they own this corridor um, right here. And then Cal California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, oops, last one. Uh, they own a large area down here, and that includes the uh, Marina Village uh, levee and detention basin um, and the trails that go around it. And then the Marin Audubon Society owns um, this small portion of land down here. So each of each of those landowners uh, maintain the trails that go through. Um, and so that's basically all I had to present. So if there's any questions on that, feel free to, to ask. Yeah. Um, sorry, my back members. Kirby. Yeah, um, I'm the one that asked for this because, um, at least up until recently, I was a regular runner through that area and noticed the um, a material difference in how certain trails were maintained, and um, some of them much better than others and uh, appreciate your, your doing this. Is there a, I'm trying to form my comments, and put my comments in the form of a question. It's kind of like Jeopardy, this is a question period. So um, <laughs> if, um, 
Is there a way to think that can you provide the contact information or the appropriate contact information for if we wanted to reach out to people and get the trails improved um, for, for each of these organizations? Yeah, we, we have that contact info. Um, it, it might have been updated in the last year, but we do have that um, from past um, press cycles. So, yeah. All right. Some of the information in particular, um, I know the Golden Gate Bridge, Dis Bridge District has it available online, um, but we can also dig into our Rolodex and get um, you know, our liaisons um, from our respective counterparts. All right. I can't think of how to form my other questions and my other comments in the form of a question, so I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, any other questions from BPAC? Okay, seeing none, we'll open up to the public for any questions or comments. Jean? Hi, Jean Severinghouse. Um, thank you. So thank you for this work of um, providing jurisdictions. It's a very complicated area, so very helpful. Um, I uh, take no credit for it, but I have an enormous thank you to the Corte Madera, um, what are they called? The Improvement Club? Community Foundation? Community Foundation. Yeah, we just had a meeting tonight and we talked about this. Yeah, yeah that they cleared the fences off the smart yeah. land just going north from the dark blue there on the smart land in the county of Marin Unincorporated. And I understand that a piece of that was that smart took responsibility for maintenance of that off of the hands of the county of Marin. So that might be another one you might want to add to your map. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Any other, anybody online who wants to comment or? Um, I don't see any hands up. I see any hands up, okay. Any comments from the BPAC? Kirby, did you want to comment? Yes. Yeah. Um, look, and I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I used to jog this, hike this quite a bit. I know you see, right, routinely yeah. see a lot of people jogging and hiking this area. Um, and one very sad thing I'd point out is at Marta's Marsh down there, the red, the red dots, um, that used to make a loop. You used to be able to, at the end, it used to not be two dead ends. They used to connect and make a loop. But over time, the, the Ray's Levee and hiking trail, um, just tidal wash and what it is, destroyed that area and made it impassable. So now they're just two dead ends. And I bring that up because um, the, the importance of if we do wanna keep these, a few simple trails open um, the way they are, um, I'd love to see that one go back to the way it was, but I doubt that's possible. But um, just having access to who those people are that have those decisions. I know it's not inexpensive to, um, to maintain the trails, but if you go out there in any given day, you'll see a lot of people out there um, walking their dogs and, and whatnot and enjoying um, the nature out there. So I um, appreciate, um, I, I recognize this is outside of Corte Madera's jurisdiction and therefore even greater appreciation for the fact that you pu pu pulled this together. Um, it's it's a, a helpful resource and hopefully a tool where we can then reach the right people because this is a nice, um, it, it feels like that it's you're in the town of Corte Madera. So um, although you're not, I guess, um, I'm glad that we at least have a starting point on hopefully maintaining the trails and knowing who to contact. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from BPEC? Yes, oh, sure. I have a comment. I, th I think Kirby that, Maybe Bob can clarify. Uh, it is part of the town. It's just that those landowners uh, are public agencies instead of um, private entities. Um, I've always looked at that area and thought, "Gee, if we could, um, if we could, uh, and as part of the climate adaptation and work on the levees, um, make a dual purpose." A facility that would not only protect us, but also provide a running and bicycle route. And then if we had a bridge over San Clemente Creek, we'd actually have a whole different, uh, a safe and separate route to Cove School and, and the that whole area over there, separate from Paradise, which I know we've worked very hard on Paradise, but it's um, 
paradise is always going to be a lot less than paradise because of the traffic volume and speed. So um, anyway, that's that's a um, an aspiration that that I have, and I would just want to share that and keep it in mind for you know when someone wins Powerball. <laughs> <laughs> You get a huge grant. We don't know what to do with. <laughs> Any other comments? Um, I was just going to touch on a couple of things that were sure. that I heard. Um, so I think there was um, some folks alluding to it. These agencies all do have different philosophies, different budgets, um, and oftentimes different mandates. Um, you know, my experience, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife is pretty hands off. They like to let things be more natural and they have probably the, the more limited budgets. Um, Golden Gate Bridge District, right? They've done those recent projects. Those are mitigation projects. And I think as part of that mitigation, they had to establish these kind of trails and maintain them. Um, so, you know, each each group is going to handle things differently. And, and by all means, we're happy to get you the contacts. Um, they are within, um, for the most part, the jurisdiction of Corte Madera, although they are kind of treated often as kind of private parcels. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from BPAC members on this? Okay. Then we will move on to project updates. Paradise Drive complete streets. RJ and Chris, I think you guys are on for this. Yeah. So um, yeah, so we'll give an update on the Paradise Drive Complete Street project. We also have um, <clears throat> hopefully Becky Dower with um, BKF Engineers has joined us as well. Yeah, I think she's on the panel. So um, so we're gonna today review the draft conceptual design with BPAC and um, just go through the process uh, to this date. So um, through public outreach, the uh, town and design team have um, collected some valuable input on project priorities. And we've put together some creative ideas on um, how to address all the needs for this corridor um, while working within the site constraints. So the purpose of this meeting is to share an overview um, of the public input received for the project, um, discuss how the input has been incorporated into the draft conceptual design drawings, um, and then obtain support from BPAC uh, prior to taking this to town council for review. So just as a refresher, um, these are the project limits. So it's on um, Paradise Drive from Westward um east to the eastern town limit which is about a thousand feet um, from east of robin drive and um, the project passes by the ring mountain open space preserve um, the marine country day school marine monastery and then several um, residential areas so um to give a recap on the project um the aim of the project is to add multimodal facilities uh, to the section of paradise between westward and the eastern town limit. Um, and that is to enhance access to the roadway for anticipated users. And so the project corridor provides access um, to important community assets, which include the um, Ring Mountain Overseas Preserve, the two schools, and nearby residential and commercial hubs. So the project goals include um, development of facilities for cyclists and pedestrians of all skill levels, um, visitors to the Ring Mountain who may require parking, and parents driving to the two schools during drop-off and pickup times. Um, also, elevating the roadway to remove the large sag will help protect against flooding and inundation from projected sea level rise. So um, the previous community involvement, um, this is a list of all the outreach we've done to um, solicit project feedback. So there were two public workshops held on November 3rd and 30th to introduce the project to the public. Um, we came to BPAC on January 20th 
um, to gain an understanding of how the project fits into the town's um, bicycle and pedestrian master plan. There's a follow up workshop on May 25th um, to share the conceptual design alternatives and solicit more feedback on the alternatives. And then we went to flood board on October 10th regarding opportunities, um, constraints and design considerations for flood and sea level rise protection that can be gained by elevating the roadway. And then throughout this whole process, we've been um, reaching out to the various stakeholders and, and meeting about um, individual issues. So, um, so this is a summary of the project feedback we've received. Um, the schools do not currently have infrastructure in place to accommodate queuing outside of the public right away. Um, Marine Country Day School has developed a preliminary plan to do so, but hasn't implemented it yet. Uh, the public uh, prefers a separated pathway and indicate a need for traffic calming to reduce vehicle speeds. Uh, due to the many other town priorities and existing shared path on the south side, the EPAC supports building the new path on the south side of Paradise Drive uh, to connect to the existing class one path that is um, west of Westward Drive in alignment with the master plan. The public identified benefits with placing the pathway on the south side of the roadway as well, um, and aligned with alternatives that provided dedicated parking for Ring Mountain users. The Flood Control Board supports elevating the roadway as much as feasible, understanding, it, uh, understanding that clearance under the existing Marin Country Day School pedestrian bridge is the limiting factor. So now I'm going to um, pass it off to Becky Dower with BKF to go over design recommendations. Yeah, um, thank you, Chris. So as Chris had noted, we had a very robust outreach process. We received lots and lots of good feedback. What we need to do next is, is distill and really boil down that feedback and come up with design recommendations and get that implemented in a plan. Um, in just a minute here, we're going to do a zoomed in walkthrough of the corridor. Um, some of the things that we're going to see on our draft conceptual design um, that were informed by the public include the following. Um, we have an alternative where the pathway is on the south side of Paradise Drive. Uh, so this will be in alignment with the existing shared use path that's west and westward. The pathway is separated from the roadway. Um, you're going to see that there's separation in a couple of different ways. Um, in some areas, the pathway has a landscape strip between the travel lane. In other areas, there's a parking buffer between the travel lanes and the pathway. So we always have some sort of horizontal separation from where the vehicles are traveling. To help combat high speeds, and just also due to um, you know, the, the fact that we are constrained by available right of way, the vehicle travel lanes are gonna be narrowed down to 10 and a half feet. So that's uh, quite narrow for a travel lane. That has been shown to um, you know, give drivers a sense of being constrained and help reduce travel speeds as they go through the corridor. While we do have a nice wide pathway that can be used for cyclists, we will also incorporate shared lane markings or sharrows so that bicyclists who are more comfortable on the road can utilize the road and the motoring public is made aware that they should encounter, they should expect to encounter bicyclists while driving. The project includes a crossing over Paradise Drive near Upland Circle. So we're going to be incorporating crossing improvements in the form of uh, rapid flashing beacons um, at the Upland Circle crossing. We've heard a need for an for dedicated parking spaces for Ring Mountain. Um, so we have programs in dedicated parking spaces for the Ring Mountain patrons. There's also available space to accommodate a sort of a flexible use parking and queuing areas that could be used by the schools or other patrons um, who, who choose to park on the street during non-school queuing times. Um, and finally, we are looking at improvements that we can do to elevate the roadway to help protect against flooding, help protect against sea level rise. All right. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and share an image on my screen so we can do a detailed walkthrough. Okay, just give me one sec. Uh, Yeah, 
Yeah, we've got some feedback previously that the portal is just so long, it's hard to see on a PowerPoint presentation. So we're gonna go into a different program here so that we can walk through the, the corridor little by little. All right, are you able to see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, so over here on the far left, this is Westward Drive. On the opposite side, uh, this is Robin Drive and this is the town limits. So I'm gonna start over here on the west side. North is pointing up towards the bay. I'm gonna start over here on the west side and we'll just cruise down Paradise and we'll point out some of the features of the project as we go. All right, as we noted earlier, the existing shared use path is on the south side of Paradise Drive. Um, that's this, this path right here. We'd make improvements so that we have an accessible curb wrap at that location and then continue that pathway, um, an eight foot wide pathway on the south side of Paradise. You can see this little green strip here. This is one of those landscape strips. So this would provide three feet of horizontal separation between the vehicle travel lanes and the pathway. You, we've got some sharrows marked here, just shown some locations where those markings can go. As we approach the Ring Mountain Trailhead, we take the pathway closer to the right of way in this location uh, so that we can create a space for some on-street parking. So you can see we still have the two travel lanes here and then some on-street parking here. This would be intended to be dedicated parking for Ring Mountain Trailhead users. It could be signed as such. Um, and then to further discourage this area to be used by, let's say, you know, queuing for the schools, um, we have um, added this bulb out essentially that could be landscaped, it could be hardscaped, but a bulb out that would interrupt the ability for a queue to continue into this area that would be dedicated for trailhead users. Where we have parking, uh, like a parking lane adjacent to the pathway, um, obviously that eats up more horizontal space within our right of way. Um, since we are limited on horizontal space in the right of way, we have looked at narrowing this landscape strip from three feet down to a foot and a half where we have that parking lane. So the parking lane is essentially acting as um, like a, a protection or separation between the vehicles that are traveling and the pedestrians. And so that's how we have justified the ability to reduce that landscape buffer from typically three feet down to one and a half feet where there is that parking or queuing lane. As we get up to up, up and away, we drop that extra parking or queuing lane, this flexible space here. And then we go back to the two travel lanes and three foot landscape strip adjacent to the eight foot pathway. Here at Upland Circle um, near the Montessori School, this is where some crossing improvements have been programmed. We would install a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. So this would be one of those flashing signs that is typically push button activated to alert, alert motorists in both directions that somebody would be crossing the street. So that we'd use that to control traffic on Paradise Drive. Um, on the north side here, um, we're we're adding some additional sidewalk here for co uh, connectivity at the school over to their parking lot. And then as we pass Upland Circle, we look at taking our otherwise eight foot wide pathway and narrowing it down to a six foot wide pathway. As we've identified, a lot of the users of the pathway uh, would terminate their journey at the Montessori school. Um, so the need for a wider pathway diminishes past this point, but we'd still keep the healthy six foot pathway uh, from Upland Circle to Robin Drive. Um, and add and look at and adding a four foot sidewalk on the north side of Paradise Drive. And this was a comment that we had received from various forms of public outreach, a desire to provide some sort of pedestrian facilities on the north side um, so that residents on the north side or, or, or patrons of the school um, can walk on the north side and then cross to the south side at our, at our new controlled crossing, uncontrolled crossing there. In front of the Montessori, we've identified an opportunity to have some um, on street parking or queuing, sort of a flexible space in this area here, um, so that parents who are, are dropping off at the school can utilize the space to queue up their vehicles 
while waiting for a gap to come into the parking lot. Uh, this movement and this approach is, is very consistent with what is currently going on at the Montessori school. This is just creating a more dedicated space for that to happen in. The project improvements terminate just east of Robin Drive. There's really limited right of way. There's, there's a lot of constraints with topography and with target development as we uh, progress upwards or eastwards, excuse me, to the town limit. Um, so we're proposing to end the sidewalk and the curb ramps just east of Robin Drive at this location here. I have a few cross sections to share as well so that you can get an idea of the general <clears throat> elevation of the roadway in relation to the existing conditions. Let me give you a quick tutorial of, of how these are generally read. So this EG, that's existing ground. So whenever you see this dashed line, that represents conditions on the ground today. Um, all of the improvements that are drawn here, these are our proposed improvements. Uh, so this first section, this represents very typically what the project will look like. Um, we have the roadway set some distance, generally six to 12 inches above existing grade. So the roadway is elevated. We have the two 10 and a half foot travel lanes. We have a landscape strip and then an eight foot pathway. And then on either side, since we are elevating the roadway, we have a fill prism. Um, so this would all just be you know, earth supported in this case with a fill prism coming down on either side back to EG or to existing grade. Here is another cross section. This one gives us an idea of what it generally looks like when we have that additional parking or queuing lane. So we continue to have the travel lanes. We will have a parking queuing lane on the south side. You can see the landscape strip has been reduced now from three feet to a foot and a half. The pathway is still eight feet. In some of these sections where we're getting a lot wider, especially when we're adjacent to those roadside ditches, we've identified the need to have retaining structures that would support the path. Um, these are they're variable in height, but they're generally less than four feet tall, these structures. So um, we would certainly plan on having some sort of railing, but this is not a, a very significant wall in terms of height. And then on the north side or the bay side, we continue to have fill prisms that support the elevated roadway. All right. With that, I will turn it back over to you, Chris. Okay. All right. Um, so this slide just demonstrates kind of where we are in the process. Um, we've obviously spent the bulk of 2022. Um, looking at alternatives, hearing a lot of public feedback, and that has really brought us to this point. Um, from the May workshop, um, we felt like we had some uh, some consistent feedback and we, we felt we had a, um, a consensus building and we kind of had some um, few loose ends that we wanted to refine and discuss with various parties. Um, we've, we've had some conversations since with flood board regarding road height and, and some um, stakeholder groups such as the schools to kind of work through those. And that really has brought us to um, the alternative that you see before you. Um, depending on where we stand as a community, um, we're looking at potentially taking this to council for kind of a, a check-in and a potentially a, a um, you know, uh, direction to proceed with final design and environmental permitting. Um, it is one of those projects that, you know, it's, it has, you know, we've, we've obviously seen the alternatives. So before expending um, too many funds and resources in that design phase, we, we are looking for that check-in with council. So um, prior to that, we obviously are here to discuss it with BPAC and hear all your feedback, see if we're on the right track and see if that's a step that we're, we're you know, the town should take here in the near future. Um, beyond that, um, if, if that is the path we, we choose to go, we'll kick off the environmental compliance phase, you know, look at everything through a lens of environmental compliance and permitting and march through um, into final design. Um, meanwhile, um, we're also um, seeking funding and have applied for um, 
recent fund sources, OBAC3, we were so close. So there's a there's a chance we might get in, but um, we were the first project out, but still received a lot of positive feedback. So that'll continue to go as opportunities are out there, um, but um, potentially could complete the final design process by fall of 2023 um, with um, enough community support. So next slide, please. So here's um, a link to our webpage for all the information we've shown today and, and other information about pre previous workshops. Um, again, with um, if we feel like we have um, support and, and feedback from BPAC today, we would start looking at um, possible council meetings as early as December. Um, and so with that, we'll open it up for discussion, questions, and comments. Thank you, RJ. So to be clear, you're looking for direction from us. And if it's good, then you would proceed to town council with that direction. That's correct. Great. Thank you. Um, so first off, are there any questions from BPAC members on this presentation? Dave McPherson. You're muted. Thanks, Bob. For a couple of years, uh, Marine County Country Day School has been telling us and the town uh, staff that they have preliminary plans, but not the funding to move the queuing off of the public's right of way and onto their private property. And Becky's slides su suggested that there is a preliminary plan in place, uh, doesn't know when it's gonna be implemented and that the, that the parking that's being designed here is quote unquote temporary. So my question is, has anyone from the town in the last six to eight months seen the preliminary plans that have been promised by MCDS to how they plan to move their uh, queuing, idling cars waiting for school to get out off of the public's right of way and onto the private property? Uh, yes, we have a copy of that plan so can you sh share it with us sure in in that regard i'd add is do they have an implementation date um not to my knowledge and i think that's um definitely going to be wrapped into the discussion with council about um how hard the town wants to push toward having them build out their private property um, I think uh, on one hand, um, if we were to get grant funds right now, you know, we could be building as early as 2024. Um, I think at a minimum, you'd have to give them ample time and, and notice. Um, so I think what we presented is a flex space that could serve that in the interim, um, but it's really open-ended and, and really requires more dialogue as to um, what deadlines could be established or should be considered for being established um, in the future. Um, RJ, were you saying that you could share those plans with us tonight at the BPAC, or is this something that you'd have to do after the BPAC? Um, no, I, I don't have them. Um, they're, they're pretty rudimentary. They're, they're more or less hand-drawn, but I'm happy to share them. Um, we can post them on the webpage. Is it effectively what I had hand drawn that shows uh, up, up and away being slightly widened so that the queue is moved off of the public's right of way and up onto their property, uh, doing a big loop up by the back gym? Yeah, it's it's similar in nature. Okay. So, all right, I'll, I'll save my comments for later. Thank you. Any other questions from BPAC members? Okay, hearing none. And we'll open it up to the public. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on this? Yes, if you can come up to the microphone and. Hi, Jean Severino. Uh, thank you to staff and to the consultants. That's a much improved project. I'm very pleased to see the north sidewalk over uh, making it safe in front of the school. Um, two questions. One is how high is the differential on the, the where there's a one foot landscape buffer and then the path, it looked like it's slightly higher than the road. So it's all being elevated. So what is that height differential? 
for the landscape buffer and the pathway versus the road? Is is it in fact is there a physical separation? That's one. And the second question is, what um, to play the devil here? What would be the cost saving of not um, providing? The, I mean, paving is expensive. So, what would be the cost saving of not providing the queuing and parking paved area? Let's leave that out of the project. Sorry, I am playing the devil here. Thank you. Thank you. And we can just save all the questions for later. Any other member of the public wish to comment on this or have questions? Comment. Yes, yeah. go ahead. <clears throat> Please uh, give your name. Hi, I'm, I'm James Toe. I'm a parent at Marine Country Day School. Um, just wanted to thank the designers for laying out the plan. I just had a question about that uh, landscape bump out between Ring Mountain or sort of the Ring Mountain hiking entrance and uh, the MCDS uh, entry. Um, I, I, I question whether that will really work uh, in trying to create different spaces to park for Ring Mountain as, as well as a space for parents to queue. Um, observationally, I know there are signs out there right now that prohibit parking uh, in, in that same section. I don't know if it's exactly the same section or if it's even larger during the hours of drop off and pickup, there are cars frequently parked there that create really a hazard, I think, because during pickup, you know, cars are zooming on by and you have to get back on the road and the line kind of zooms around. It, and I, and practically speaking, if you put that there, it's just like a parked car is gonna be there. If the line happens to be longer on any given day, people are just gonna go around it. So I, I'm not sure that, really affects or, or makes the situation better. And I question the, the safety of it. Thanks. Thank you. Any other member of the public? Is there anybody online who wants to comment or question? Um, yeah, Warren Wells, I'll speak now. Okay. Hi, this is Warren Wells, Policy and Plan Director for the Marin County Bicycle Coalition. Um, just wanted to express my support and appreciation for um, the project team and staff on this, I, I think it's really come a long ways and, and looks really great. Um, just a couple quick um, comments or, or questions. Um, I noticed that the parking slash queuing lane, you know, where we drop the the buffer to a narrow to to one point five feet, that parking queuing lane is is ten feet. Is that a standard? Because um, you know, parking lanes are typically either seven or eight feet. Um, and given that that there won't be through traffic on that, I was wondering if you could narrow that um, and keep that keep that buffer, which would make the two way bicycle and pedestrian travel. Sorry, I'm just squawking um, on the path a little uh, more pleasant. Second, um, I noticed the I was wondering what the the curb radius at up up and away looks fairly large, and I just encourage project team to look at tightening that curb radius. Um, you know, especially when you have children crossing crosswalks, um, when you tighten that curb radius, you reduce the crossing distance and slow down cars making that right turn um, from paradise um, onto up, up and away. Um, but other than that, I think uh, things look great and just want to again, express uh, our appreciation and, and support for the, pro the uh, process so far. Thanks so much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions online? Um, yeah, one more from David. Okay. Great. <clears throat> thank you to the committee in the town and thank you to everyone who's worked so hard on this project. Uh, we live uh, on Paradise Drive and see every day the hazardous situation created by the traffic uh, and the current flow pattern. So just really exciting to see all the work and resources and what is, is really an imperative, I think, for members of the community here. But one question I had was just, on the extent to which the sidewalk extends on the north side of the of Paradise going towards the Cordovadera town border. I guess for some reason it's been put on the, the north side, that sidewalk as it extends into the bend versus the south side, uh, as you think about going east from Robin. Uh, and just given the, the new development that has gone into that apartment complex, just if there's a consideration for on the south side of Paradise, extending the sidewalk uh, up into the curve versus just doing it on the north side. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, Chris? 
I don't think so. Okay. Uh, with that, we will close public comment. And RJ, did you want to address sure. some of the questions we had here? And yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Um, let's start. Um, so I'll actually kick it to BKF for a couple of the technical ones regarding, um, I think there's the height between the landscape strip and the path. And then there was also one about, um, the 10 foot wide parking and queuing lane. Becky, you can chime in on any of those. Yeah, I would love to hop in. So the landscape strips are elevated above the roadway. They're intended to be elevated six inches above the roadway. So that corresponds to the height of a standard curb. Um, so you would you could think of it as a curb next to the travel lane and the landscape strip is at the same elevation as the top of the curb. <clears throat> um, in terms of the width of the parking and queuing lane, um, we have consulted with our traffic engineer um, regarding what the appropriate width for this facility be, because it's it's intended at least for a temporary uh, condition to be a flexible use space. Since we would expect vehicles to be moving in this area, you know, if you're queuing, you know, hopefully you're making some progress and moving. Um, he felt that going wider than a standard parking lane would be appropriate. Um, and that's where the 10 foot came from. Um, you know, there's absolutely opportunities to revisit that and see if we could get more of, of a you know, larger landscape strip and narrow that down to eight and a half. Um, but that was the justification around that larger lane is that vehicles, at least during the queuing periods, would be moving in that space. Okay, thank you. Um, the other comments I wrote down, um, so definitely hear you on enforcement. That's uh, always a challenge, but, you know, we're, we're dealing with that challenge now and, and we'll have to revisit that and, and get some commitments from, um, you know, the various stakeholders um, in the meetings we have had with the school, they have shown a commitment to um, self-enforce a lot of those situations. And, and so hopefully they will, especially if it's a facility that um, provides any sort of improvement to them in the community. Um, but definitely uh, no, no easy task that won't require a lot of um, further discussion. Um, Let's see. I think there was a question about can a sidewalk continue east on the south side? So right as at Robin Drive heading up the hill. And, um, you know, for those that are familiar with it, the really the, the hill, um, it moves up. It, it, um, you're, you're going up a hill and plus it's a turn. And you've got the large hillside on your right. So it really becomes um, uh, expensive very fast. I mean, I think to even gain what you would need for a sidewalk, you might be looking at like a 10 foot retaining wall to put a sidewalk on that side. And that's um, out of our budget, at least at this point in time, especially if you look at um, kind of the different characters of that roadway, you know, we feel the, the corridor between Westward and Robin Drive is roughly consistent. Um, but as you start to go beyond Robin Drive, it starts to um, take on a different character that feels like the rest of Paradise Drive. So, I mean, if Tiburon and the county ever wanted to put together a bigger project where that sidewalk, you know, extend way beyond and, and there are, you know, further benefits, I think I, I could, um, you know, come around to supporting that. But, but in this juncture, it, it's a very expensive proposition to even add 50 feet or 100 feet of sidewalk on the south side. And, and I, I don't, I think the nearest home is, um, you know, several properties up around that corner compared to the north side, which there's, you know, a number of properties kind of right after another that it would benefit. So, um, but good question and and open to further feedback on that one. Um, Chris, did you catch any other comments that we haven't addressed yet? Um, yeah, uh, Gene asked uh, if there was a cost savings to leaving oh. out the queuing and um, I mean, I think it would depend what we replace it with, but if it was just parking, it would basically be the same amount because we still have to pave that parking lane. So, yeah, I guess, um, the question I would have, so, I mean, in general, um, you know, if we wanted to compute, you know, the asphalt by the ton, we often would say, you know, roughly maybe $250 a ton and we could run those numbers pretty quick, but, um, you know, once you set the sidewalk location, you've paid for it and invested in that location. So we can't just, you know, shift it around. So I guess I would just want to understand the, um, 
the purpose of that? And then I guess if you weren't to pave that, would you propose to put the sidewalk closer to the road? I guess, how would you utilize that space in a way that um, benefits the overall project? Um, I, I think more dialogue to better understand the request. So. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Anything else? Um, okay, then we'll bring it back to BPAC for comments on this. Cheryl, well, like uh, I guess a question, um, because the, um, I, I think the question about the um, width of the queuing lane and that the rationale for 10 feet was because the, the traffic will be moving. But I think in most queuing situations, it's start and stop and you're going maybe 20 feet when you move and maybe at five miles an hour. So I'm I'm wondering if there could be um, narrowing of that queuing area. And again, as, as you said, RJ, what, what space, what other benefit could that space be used? But I, I think it would, it would encourage, I, I just don't wanna see the, the space used for queuing if, if uh, so, so could we use, if it were eight foot, like a traditional, uh, parking lane, slow moving lane. Um, what could we use the two feet for? Yeah, just to um, elaborate on kind of Becky's response, I, I think the traffic engineer is viewing this like you would a turn lane, right? Even though it's queuing, there is some movement and the closest standard is a turn lane in which you would typically want 10 feet or more. Um, you know, there isn't a, a chapter in the MUTCD that talks about you know, school queuing lanes. So that's the, the closest. Um, we can we can certainly have a dialogue, but I guess, um, yeah, what would be the, the benefit is, are we talking about putting it toward a wider landscape? Or are we talking about um, making that section of path wider than the other parts of the path on either side? Or possibly is it maybe a, a foot or two of extra road width for the cyclists that stay on the road? I, you know, I'm open to it. Um, but yeah, happy to, would like to hear more about what we want to do with it and go from there. Okay, uh, any comments, direction? Looking for direction from us on this? Yeah, I've got a comment, Bob. <clears throat> um, so going back to the history of this, about four years ago, the Marine Country Day School came to the town of Corte Madera uh, <clears throat> with a proposition for a very expensive, uh, I think it was $40 million capital improvement to, the, to their school. And during multiple meetings, the, uh, the MCDS architects, engineers, and, and uh, staff and, and uh, principals all promised the town that they would move this queuing off the road. Uh, they would accommodate parking for all of their people without using the public's right of way. Uh, and so the town relied upon that and, and the various town managers that have been in place ever since, I don't think have ever really put their foot down and sort of give, gave the MCDS a drop dead date to move their queuing off of the public's right away and onto their private property. And so I've been you know, harping on that throughout this whole process because what we're seeing from BKF is exactly what I was hoping we wouldn't have to see. And that is, is that we're giving uh, the public right away 10 feet for queuing when it's unnecessary if MCDS had done what they promised they would do. If there wasn't a 10 foot wide uh, queuing lane there, you could have, I mean, the irony that you've got 10 feet of queuing being provided to an elite private school for cars to idle while you have an eight foot wide multi-use path is not lost on me. What we should have there is no queuing. What we should have there is a three foot wide landscape buffer and we could easily accommodate a 12 foot wide uh, beautiful multi-use path. And I disagree with RJ and Chris in terms of cost. What we're doing here by leaving that queuing lane is you have to put in retaining walls to protect the drainage swale. If you didn't have that 10 foot wide queuing lane, you could have a wider multi-use path being built at less of a cost because you wouldn't have to retain it as far as I can tell. I mean, 
BKF would have to tell us if that's true, but I see cost savings by demanding that MCDS move forward and get the queuing off of paradise. So, um, you know, I guess my, my feeling about this really hasn't changed in the last year. Uh, it's, I think it's a shame that we haven't had the political will to uh, push harder on the MCDS uh, board of, and their staff to allocate the funds. Uh, they certainly raised a lot of money to do that huge uh, infrastructure capital improvement project, and they just didn't allocate enough to, to make up up and away wider, and, and they could have. Uh, so that's, I mean, I, listen, I, I appreciate the, the conflicting uh, stakeholders here. I just think it's a big mistake to suggest that providing queuing is a community asset. I mean, those are really the wrong words to be using. I think it's an abuse of a public right of way by a private school. I think it's a it's a illusory at best to suggest that it's temporary. It's nonsense. The moment that 10 foot wide queuing lane is put in place in our lifetime, you're not gonna see it go away and you're not gonna see a better multi-use path. And so from my perspective, we should be pushing hard on MCDS to keep their promise. And uh, BKF should provide an alternate view to the town council that says, parking for Ring Mountain, yes. No queuing lane for MCDS. Uh, saw, uh, savings or cost savings by being able to provide a better multi-use path with a wider buffer to the uh, traffic lane. That's it. Okay, thank you, David. So you're behind the project in general, but you want to make sure that uh, you want to ask that we figure out how to move parking off paradise for MCDS. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm ecstatic at, at you know, we've, we've been pushing on this for a decade. I'm ecstatic that uh, this part of Corte Madera is going to have uh, the bicycle pedestrian access that it's it's long been uh, denied. Uh, but like, to make it more specific, I'd like the town council, uh, I'd like BKF to provide alternate plans that show what it would look like if there was no queuing lane when it was brought before the town council. And I'd like the uh, town manager and the town council to come to an agreement as to whether or not there's going to be a drop dead date for MCDS to uh, to uh, put in place their quote unquote preliminary plan. Okay, thank you. Further comments from BPAC members? Kirby, you got your hand up. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, I like the presentation. Um, I was, my initial thoughts were just to say, great job, I'm, I'm supportive. Um, but I found David's comments actually fairly compelling. Um, so uh, it seems to me this is an opportunity to force a conversation um, that will never, this is, there's never a better time to have that conversation. Um, so uh, I'm supportive overall, but I also think David makes a compelling point. Thank you, Kirby. Cheryl? Well, I I also agree with with David, and I don't recall the specifics four years ago. But if that's the case, that that this is talked about four years ago, and it appears that nothing's been done, uh, the Marion Country Day School needs to step up. I believe. I think the town. I would hope the town council would step up and and um, make a true, make them make a true commitment to having. Uh, to diverting the queuing onto their own private property. All right, thank you. Tony, anything else? Uh, I'm in agreement with uh, everyone else. Okay. Yeah. RJ and Chris, it sounds like you have <clears throat> direction. Okay. So you will then, I guess you'll be writing this up and you'll eventually be presenting it to the town council. I can actually talk about it tomorrow night or two, I guess. Yeah, um, so for a little more guidance, um, 
I, I mean, I, I, I understand kind of the logic and conversation here. Um, at the same time, you know, they're, they are, they have constraints and they also have resources. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I also want to share this just to be devil's advocate. There are many schools in Marin that do just this. And so sure. Um, it's a tough decision for council to either a put their foot down or find a way for everyone to make their way through the corridor more safely. Um, and I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer, but, um, you know, I've, you know, for instance, I'll, I'll, you know, there's several schools in Larkspur that this happens. I think probably even happens on um, <clears throat> Redwood High School. And um, I even saw it on my way going up to Tahoe and North Store Resort. It's backs up all the way. So I just want to say it's not the only place this happens. Um, and it's a tough challenge. And um, I was hoping for a little more guidance on how we can present this to council um, <clears throat> shy of going back and preparing two separate plans. Is there, what would we do with the space if we were to, um, other than just the cost component, how would we better utilize that? Is there any suggestions on that? Well, I think one would be to have, you mentioned it yourself, having a, a little more space for riders that are on the street. Um, that that they would feel more comfortable, um, and that that cars could pass them more easily, if the the traffic lane were were wider instead of the um, the queuing lane. That's one possibility. Yeah, it's, it seems. And I don't know, and I don't recall how wide the the landscaping is. I think the wider the landscaping, the better too. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the buffer. Yeah, it was because I mean we're that was in context of slimming that buffer or flex space down from 10 to I think Becky said maybe eight and a half would be considered. So that's a foot and a half that could do those things. But what what is the plan to do with 10 feet if it all goes away? And are we willing to wait to build the project to allow the private schools however many years is reasonable to um, build out? Yeah, I, I don't. We're applying for um, currently applying for um, grant funds that we were saying we're ready to go as early as 2024. Yeah. So, I so, think it might be worth pointing out if I if I could interject real quick is that um, if we were to remove that queuing parking lane and basically you know increase the landscape <laughs> strip and then shift the pathway towards the road or and or widen the pathway, um, we would we would need to make sure that we have a good understanding of how much parking we want to have for the trailhead because we don't want to eliminate that entire lane necessarily. So we, we want to make sure that we nail that because once we place the pathway closer to the road and lose that queuing lane, we've also lost the ability for overflow parking for the marsh or for the trailhead. So that that is a consideration too, as we just, we want to make sure we get the right amount there. Okay. I just, I guess, an, an additional comment. I don't know if Becky can address this, but if the queuing lane is eliminated, and if the would the retaining wall still be necessary if the uh, multi-use path shifted closer to the traffic lane? Yeah, you're you're not incorrect in stating that that the wall would probably be shorter. It would it would certainly be shorter. Um, these are not particularly tall walls, you know, I think at the tallest we're thinking about four feet, you know, and so when you move that parking lane and you bring the, the pathway in closer, the wall would get shorter, it might get eliminated. Um, I don't know exactly what that would look like without laying it out, but I think we would see, we would see that improvement. Yeah, and so to me, you, you, cut, you have some cost savings there, you have the ability to make the multi-use lane wider if you choose. You certainly would have plenty of space to make a three foot wide landscape buffer so it was consistent. And then you'd have a fog line uh, where, where, um, where the queuing line uh, would have been. And so for the recreational, fast recreational cyclists, you provide a much safer situation for cars to pass them in that long strip between 
Red Ring Mountain and up, up and away. So it's safer for the people on the path. It's cheaper to build it. And it's safer for the recreational cyclists who are being overtaken by cars on Paradise Drive. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to make a rare exception to protocol here. And because we do have a member of the Land Use Committee from Marin Country Day here, and you wanted to say something? Yeah. Hi, I'm James Toe again. I'm a member of the Buildings and Grounds Committee at MCDS. Not necessarily authorized to speak on their behalf, but I am working on this issue. And I, I had a comment because I know David said, and forgive me, I was not part of the conversation four years ago, but my understanding um, regarding uh, the improvements for the science building that was, were done and going to the town council, my understanding was uh, as part of that approval, a bunch of parking spaces had to be made off to the bay side of Paradise Drive um, to, to, move, to remove parking from Paradise Drive. And it's my understanding that the school and none of its staff parks along Paradise Drive. So I'm, I, I think there might be an issue about conflating parking and queuing. It's my understanding, and when we met most recently, that the school is in full compliance with their CUP. So this notion of us saying we're going to do something and never doing it or not doing it as part of this improvement, I think it, it isn't a story that I understand it to be. Um, as far as queuing is concerned, I, I understand the desire, you know, the trade-off that's there. But to RJ's point, I, I do think, you know, this is maybe 15 minutes of the day, mostly in the afternoon. Um, what would be parking spots, most likely anyway, I think the school does a pretty good job managing, you know, the outflow of children and, and families. Um, you know, by comparison, and, and I'm, I don't, I'm not intimately aware of this, but I know Marin Montessori, we provide parking to, to staff at Marin Montessori in our parking lot to, to try to alleviate the, the congestion on Paradise Drive. I don't know how many students they have, but I, you know, they don't have, a, there's no issue over their dedicated queuing, I don't think, right? They, you know, they don't even have the, I, I think as per, per their CUP, they don't even have the right to queue. So we have signs out there, like, I, I don't know how long it's been going on, but there's been queuing along Paradise Drive for a while. And with the town's consent. So I'm, I'm a little confused about sort of this notion that as part of our prior CUP and coming to the to the council that we were required to pull all the cars off Paradise Drive and we somehow didn't do it. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure that we can actually answer that question this evening. I don't think we have the staff or the capability to do that. Um, I can tell you I was in the last meeting or one of the last meetings with Marine Country Day and staff was there and yes uh, Marine Country Day is in compliance with the CUP at this point so you do have direction RJ for what the Bi Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee would like to see we understand there are still some issues with Marine Country Day I think what we're doing is we're pushing this up to the town council because they're the only ones who can actually make a decision on this and decide what the best thing is, but I think we've gotten direction from BPAC. So if everyone's okay with that, I'm gonna just close this item and move on to the next one, if that's okay with everybody. Okay, okay. Uh, let's move on to Central Marin Regional Pathway Project. Okay, okay. so um, I think in the last few meetings, this has come up because um, we haven't, discussed it in a while, but the Central Marin Regional Pathway Project, give a quick update um, and go over the project plans. Um, so as of December 2021, the town um, completed design and environmental phases for the project. That also coincides when our design grant um, was up. So got that part complete. Um, so as of now, Public Works needs to do the following prior to construction. So first and foremost, we need to find grant funding um, to pay for the project. And we've been applying to grants lately. Um, and we I don't think we didn't get selected for ATP, which was the most recent one. Right. Um, they've they've made it, they've been changing their rubric and they've 
they've uh, apportioned most of the funding for low income areas of the county. So um, it's it's more difficult not even the county within the state and region. And okay. actually, Marin is getting um, very little, if any, ATP funds. But um, we do actually have um, one possible um, candidate grant. Um, I don't have all the specifics on it, but we do have one um, in the works that potentially could fund half the project. Remind us which, which project is uh, physically. Yeah. yeah, this is um, here I have a little diagram. So uh, this is the project that connects several bike paths. Um, so there's a class one path along Warnham Drive. Um, and then we're proposing to add a class four bike path along Nellen. Um, and then that will connect across Pfeiffer to um, where Nellen continues down towards um, the freeway overpass. So um, that's the project. Is that okay. 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 So um, yeah, so to continue, yeah, we need to find grant funding. We have one possible um, option coming up. Um, and then we need, uh, we have to, staff needs to complete a detailed review of the 100% plans because um, we just recently received those and haven't gone through everything yet. And then the last piece is to acquire a Caltrans encroachment permit because the area um, underneath the Warham Drive is technically in there right away. So that um, will take a few months as well. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, it's uh, the project's been rating highly in grant submissions, but we haven't been selected for funding yet. And the current estimate is um, with project management and contingency is uh, 1.54 million or 1.5. Oh, five, four million. Uh, um, and then the, it's anticipated that construction will take two months to complete once um, we get everything going. Thank you for the update. Uh, so yeah, I can, um, so this is just a oh. exhibit, but I can go through the plans if you want to look at more detailed. Um, so, so in some ways, this is the best opportunity for um the UPAC to look at the details I think that was the request of the previous meeting um okay because we are hopeful we could get grant funds quickly and we will likely go straight into um bidding and advertising construction if we do um, okay so go ahead okay oh. Okay. Um, let me see. So, um, as I mentioned, the projects on, uh, on Warnham Drive, Nellen, and then a little bit on Pfeiffer. Um, so, here are a few cross sections. Oops. So this is on Warnham Drive. And for the most part, we're just uh, rebuilding the existing path that goes along it. Um, we're proposing to have a 10 foot um, multi-use pathway. Um, we are gonna be pushing the curb and gutter out into the road to provide a wider buffer. So um, they're proposing here a five foot um, buffer with a planter in between. So this is adjacent to the DMV. This is the highly used um, Warnham path. <clears throat> this is the one that has tons of, um, historically has had roots uplifting the pavement that have needed repair from time to time. Um, so although the curb is bumping out into the roadway and creating more buffer, um, we're, by reducing the median strip, we're actually still able to achieve a four foot, um, shoulder, which is the minimum class two bike lane width. Yep, exactly. So, um, moving farther down uh, this section, I believe, oh yeah, it shows that, um, you know, while we're bumping the curb out, we're also um, bumping the medium curb in. So it maintains the same amount of space in the roadway um, for class two. Farther down, um, this is where the um, pathway and road go under the freeway and there's a retaining wall behind. So the only difference here is that there's a wall up against um, the back of the path, but uh, it actually widens to 11 to 13 feet. So it should provide more room um, without a shoulder on that side. So 
So um, this is going under the freeway. You can see the um, bridge supports are in the middle here. So similar here, we're gonna be bumping the curb out and providing um, a 10 foot path. And then um, we'll have a two foot shoulder and a three foot offset in between. And then this is towards um, getting towards Robert Highway, similar design as the other two locations, maintaining a minimum 10 foot path. So let's not go through everyone. Let's just do representatives and uh, cross sections. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there's only two more. Um, so this is on Nellen. Um, this is representative. So on this would be the west side of the road. There's the eight foot class four cycle track, um, which will be both directions. Um, a three foot uh, stripe buffer, eight foot parking. And then two 10 and a half foot lanes. And to achieve that, we have to push the curb out there as well. So we'll um, we'll be losing parking on the east side of the road and um, maintaining the parking on the west side. Um, Pfeiffer, where we'll be crossing, adding a new enhanced crossing. Um, we're just widening the median to add a um, protected area in the center. Um, just basically just an area that pedestrians can stop before crossing the two lanes that are next to the freeway on and off. This one is um, better visualized in plan view, and we'll show that later. Yeah. So I'll just briefly go through these because it basically just shows plan view of what we just saw. But um, this is the 10 foot path. Um, this area is the vegetated um, buffer zone. Um, and you can see here the median is is um, getting smaller to allow space for that. Um, moving down, so this is where uh, Warnham intersects with Nellen Avenue. So we're adding um, curb ramps, doing um, RRFBs, uh, rapid flashing beacons for a safer crossing, um, and then just maintaining the crosswalk there. Um, this lost it. Uh, oh yeah, so here we're going under the freeway. Um, this is the other side of the freeway um, coming out. So under the, in this area we have a hardscape buffer, and then over here we'll just be reconnecting with the curb ramp that's already built, and that connects across the street um, to the Redwood Highway path. Um, so this is on Nellen Avenue. You can see on this is the west side of the road. There's the new cycle track, and then um, this buffer striping continues down. Um, and so basically, we're adding parking um, and a buffer in between the new cycle track and the travel lanes to add extra protection for um, bicyclists. And we'll have to be we'll have to move the curb um, along this whole stretch. Um, just continuing down, this is at the end of Nellen, so we'll be improving this area, um, which is connected to the cycle track, um, and widening the, the path here, uh, onto Pfeiffer. <clears throat> there won't be a direct connection. They'll have to be, they'll be led to this staggered crosswalk here. Exactly. So you'll have to take a left and then, um, the crosswalk is also staggered, so you'll go into the median, cross over here. Cross one lane at a time, and then as you're um, proceeding down the median, you're faced in the direction of oncoming traffic, um, so it improves your ability to make eye contact with drivers before making the second crossing. Exactly, and we're adding uh, rapid flashing beacons here as well to um, make it a safer crossing, and I I believe the existing crosswalk is closer to Nellen, so we're trying to push these back to um, add add more buffer from the on and off ramps. Um, I believe, uh, yeah, that's so. That's basically the entire project. The, the rest of the slides are just um, striping. Um, you can kind of see the the cycle track here a little better, um, and we're leaving. You know room for driveways as you go down Nellen. Yeah, anything else you want to present? 
Um, that was it for the plans. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Uh, are there questions from BPAC members about the presentation? Bob, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Cheryl. Um, is there any plan to um, change the trees? Because the trees have caused the damage along Warnham, and just to build right over that might continue the damage. That's one question. Another question is about um, lighting, since this, I think, will be a, a route that people uh, will use going to and from uh, the ferry in particular, and also the smart <laughs> um, and that may be commuting it in um, times of dusk or darkness. So especially under the freeway, I don't know what lighting is there now, but is there any plans for lighting? You want to respond to the first one, Chris? Sure. Um, yeah, we've been, the tree question is a little complicated. Um, the trees that are on town property, we're planning to assess and I think mostly remove if they're damaging the path because to, when we're rebuilding the path, we're going down a foot. And so any roots there are going to be removed and which will likely kill the trees. Um, the more complicated issues are the trees on the DMV property. So we've been in talks with them over the last year and um, we're going to have to figure out some deal with them to, to handle the roots because likely when we build a new path, it's going to cut the roots and compromise the trees. So we're working with them. So the pathway section is similar to Redwood Highway. So we do what we call full depth reclamation. So it really does get rid of the roots that are already under the path. So right there off the bat, you're, you're buying yourself decades of better performance. Um, but at the same time, as you disturb roots, the trees could suffer. And so that's where we go into the arborist investigation, arborist report. And in all likelihood, a lot of the trees will have to be removed and we can look into replanting some of them. But um, the path will be um, not what we see now where it gets a Band-Aid resurfacing and then they propagate, you know, three to five years later. Um, on the lighting, currently um, there, there isn't lighting um, um, in the scope of the project. Um, so that would um, require some further discussion. Um, it's something that if there was enough of a push and funding, it, it could always be, um, it wouldn't preclude it down the line, but um, that wasn't part of the um, original grant. We did, we did receive um, ATP funds for the design back um, 2017, 2018. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, Bob, I have another question. Yeah. I have a question. Um, was it within the scope of uh, Parisi's work to consider any additional accommodation for bicycles and pedestrians who are crossing Redwood Highway at Warnham? <clears throat> um, I don't believe that was part of the scope, although I know that's been a topic that's been brought up. So um, I think um, at one point we were waiting on, um, there was a county HSIP project that we thought was going to be able to take the that intersection and, and make some improvements with surplus funds and do some um, lead pedestrian interval. Um, we heard at some point um, in the last few months that they were unable to include that intersection. So now we probably have to revisit that and, and look at that. Um, but the, the main modification I've heard is for the lead pedestrian interval. Um, I, I don't know if there's other enhancements that you've, um, you're thinking of. I'll save it for the comments. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from BPEC? Okay, any comments from the public? Yes, go ahead. Yes, hi, Jean Severinos. Um, thank you for the presentation. So I, the, this project, it seems is a little different than the ones I had seen a couple of years ago drawn out by Parisi. So um, I'm all for whatever you can do to improve the class one on one of them, that's terrific. Um, I don't understand exactly what's happening at Pfeiffer and Nellen that was going to be reopening the road to cars turning right there. Has that gone away? I will ask, I'll respond when you're done. All at once? Okay. I have quite a few, so I'm trying to get my head around the, the new project. Um, so uh, Caltrans, I thought, was very concerned about 
that's the that's the um southbound lucky drive exit is a high crash area very dangerous and so when you when you as a pedestrian if you cross that crosswalk and a car stops for you the person can't see the driver coming down the freeway doesn't see them so there's been a lot of rear enders there so i had understood that caltrans did not want to see um, any kind of a signalization lane and improvement thing. And so can you comment on the discussions you've had with Caltrans on that uh, rapid flashing beacon? Um, I totally support the one-gate medium on Pfeiffer because it helps the bus passengers get to it. I don't see this as a viable bike route. So I really question the, the use of putting the class four on, especially if it's staying Close. There doesn't seem to me there's any reason whatsoever in the street to remove the parking or to put a class four bikeway there. Also, the crossing of the crosswalk from the main to the main path, the visibility is terrible because there's a median barrier under one lane in the overpass. So I forget which side of the street the north or the south, but you can't. The drivers can't see you in the crosswalk. So we'll, the fact that you've moved the crosswalk. Uh, north a little bit, will that improve the visibility of that crosswalk to drivers on one? Thank you. Thank you. Any other further public comment or questions? Um, looks like Warren has his hands up, but I'm not sure if that was from before. Yeah, thanks. This is Warren Wells from uh, Marine Bay Bicycle Coalition. I, I do have a couple questions. Um, uh, actually, I had a similar question as Gene had about whether there was still planned um, an opening of that dead end on um, on Nellen that I had seen in previous plans, but didn't see it, didn't feel like I saw it in plan view here. Um, was curious just out of curiosity what the uh, delineator type um, is planned. If that's in in the current plans, whether those class one delineators or K seventy ones. I was curious, again, I, I just was kind of in the breeze through, I was curious what the lane width is um, passing by the island on Pfeiffer at Nellen with the new um, RRF, the proposed RRFD there. Um, in my experience, um, those, you know, an, an, an island crossing with an RRFD, um, if, if cars are going quickly through there, they're not very effective. And if, and if you have a, a fairly narrow lane width through there, it looks like you have 40 feet curb to curb. And I think it, I, I didn't catch there was any, any curb widening. If, it, if the island is just eight feet, then you still have another 32 feet. Um, so 16 foot lanes, I guess, but I, I didn't catch that. Um, so I would encourage as much narrowing there as possible to increase yield rates. My last question was if, if, if I could, um, the way I saw the, the crossing, it looked like bicyclists, northbound bicyclists on Nellen would have to turn, kind of make a sharp left, um, you know, at Pfeiffer, a sharp left from the class four, and then cross and then make a, like a, a right and then a left across uh, to get across. Is that, is that correct? Um, you know, I, I again, it would just encourage a, a wider median. Um, then rather than making that kind of dog, very difficult dog leg, which is, you know, challenging under the conventional bike, but even more challenging if, if you're riding a cargo bike or, or something larger, a, a recumbent or a tail. All right. That's right. That's a few questions, but I really appreciate your time and, and like the directions the project to go get. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, thank you. Any other members of the public wish to comment? Okay, right, we'll bring it back to... Um... Yeah, I mean, RJ and Chris, yep. can you answer yeah. some of the questions or? Sure. Um, let's see if we can pack some of these. So, um, let's see. So, yeah, the opening at Nellin. Um, so, that was a considered option in the mitigated negative declaration. Um, I know that was a, um, a big push, I believe, by the prior director of public works. Um, we looked at it as the design process went. <laughs> along and um couldn't really quantify the benefits of that it was it was um and i'll have to if, if you're interested in more information i'll have to um get back with parisi on that but um it, it was adding more movements to an already 
busy location, right? You've got the, the bus stop there um, on 101. You've got, um, you know, the, the existing non-standard on-ramp, off-ramp, and it wasn't clear what we were actually solving by that. Mm -hmm. um, I say that recognizing that we know there's a, a long left turn as you go on Tamil Vista onto Nellon, but it really didn't, um, the benefits didn't shine through. Um, so that was kind of my initial response to that. Um, <clears throat> so for the crosswalk at Pfeiffer, um, the one as you, if a car is coming off of Highway 101, that crosswalk, I believe, is in the same location. It's really just the one um, on the opposite side, on the Joanne side, that gets staggered. So, and, and in the meantime, if you could pull up the plan view showing the width, because I think that was another question. Um, so I think there was a, a slight bit of widening to kind of minimize that crossing distance, but really the biggest improvement was um, the staggering effect and also, um, you know, the RRFBs, which um, if you're going to cross there, I would think you would want RRFBs compared to not having them, which is the current condition. Um, let's see this. <clears throat> so, yeah, the total road uh, lanes plus median proposed is 40 feet. So each crossing is 16 <laughs> feet and then there's an eight foot um, mm -hmm. island. Yeah, so you can see where it does widen out. Um, if you zoom in, there's kind of the existing gray median, and they do push out um, what looks to be at least two feet on each side. Um, so it is kind of narrowing, and hopefully that does um, also slow some of the cars as they approach the, um, the crossing as well. The Nellon crossing at Warnham, I believe, is also in the same alignment. Um, we're upgrading the ADA compliant ramp on the Sandra Marker side. I think the one on um, the Nellon side, I believe it is mostly compliant already. Um, you know what we're talking about, Chris? Near Nellon? Oh, no. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't think there's a whole lot of change going on there other than the addition of the RFB. I don't believe there's much of a shift um south or the north end. it's the one yeah, it's this one you're looking at right okay now. um so yeah, I, don't, I don't i don't think there's much of a change there other than yeah the addition of the rfbs I'm, I'm sorry warren i apologize that there was kind of a last comment at the end i didn't quite um uh, I take in I what, what it was you're you're getting at I think he was just asking um, what uh, if there was a dog leg, um, and it, I think the answer is yes because the bicyclist will be coming off Nellon, yeah, take a left, yes. cross, come yeah. over, and then if you're continuing up Nellon, you have to cross the road and yeah. go up. Yeah, so we do have um, right away in that area, so we can make a nice smooth turn to get over to that. Um, that curb ramp and that crossing, even on a bicycle or a um, cargo bike, so we can see, uh, make a note of that and make sure that's incorporated. Yeah, in this in this location. Yeah, so we'll we can refine that if it's not um, included now. Um, it's the ones I was able to capture. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Then I will bring it back to the B pack for comments and you're looking for direction from us on this? Yeah, um, you know, these are near complete. Um, you know, we're awaiting grant funds. We have one um, that we think is, is has some um, real potential of getting funded. And, and so this would be a good opportunity to um, make refinements, make suggestions ahead of that. Um, this grant fund that we are exploring with Tam does have a, a quick turnaround. Um, if we get it, we would find out early in 23 and we'd have to be in construction phase by early fall. So, Great. Um, so promising on that side and we hope it works out. Um, and we definitely want to incorporate any adjustments ahead of that. So um, okay. appreciate your comments. Thank you. Bring it back to the BPAC. Anybody want us to make comments on the plan or anybody, David? So 
I'm pleased with everything. Um, and so I hope that the grant funding comes through. RJ, it, as far as that crosswalk across Redwood uh, Highway at Warnham, is it does, is there cost involved to have the leading pedestrian interval programmed? Is it just programming the lights or is there uh, hardware that needs to be installed? Yeah, so um, we did it recently. I believe it was at Eastman. Um, so there's a retiming of the signal. There is um, some hardware that goes in. Um, but overall, it's, um, it's, it's definitely something we can do off to the side. It doesn't have to be incorporated in this project. Okay. And I think that's on our list anyway. So we should just, I think, make that happen here in the, the near term. Okay. I just, I just want to plant the seed to remind us all that uh, we're aware that there have been two uh, collisions between uh, children and uh, vehicles at that crosswalk. <clears throat> One involved a driver who was proceeding north on Redwood, making a left onto Wernham, uh, and hit a, a child who was pushing a bicycle across. And another one was where a driver proceeding uh, east towards the bay on Wernham made a right onto Redwood Highway going towards Nordstrom and also clipped a pedestrian. Neither one was serious injuries, but it, it just, uh, there's plenty of kids that use that going back and forth to school. So if we can make sure that Parisi, uh, not to hold up this particular project, but has in mind at some point in the future, uh, implementing whatever additional safeguards can be done. I know certainly in Larkspur, um, it's pretty impressive how, his, his designs using both uh, bollards and protection around uh, turning radiuses is, is, uh, has really made some safe improvements. And I'm not sure if that's appropriate for Redwood Highway because it's signal, signalized, but I just, I would love to see whatever modern thinking can come to bear on that uh, sidewalk. Thank you. Are there any other comments from DPAC members? Kirby. Uh, yeah, I just want to kind of reiterate what David said and that this really is a major artery for kids that want to go uh, to school and back. Um, the Hall Middle School and high school kids, this is this is the artery that they take, and I'm glad to see this project moving forward. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. It sounds like then you've got direction and we can continue to roll with this and yep. thank you for all the work you guys have put into this. This is a complicated one. So thank you very much. Appreciate yep, it. Absolutely. Uh, we'll now move on. Uh, does anybody want to propose any talk about any future agenda items? Um, I was wondering if we could get a report, if you, if you have any information on the Tamil Pius crossing and what um, Caltrans is doing with that. Okay. Then we can look at that on a future agenda. It'll be on a town council agenda soon too. Might be on tomorrow. Um, potentially in December. I thought. Okay. Uh, anything else? Okay. Um, then is, I is, it, is it worth um, the BPAC getting an update on the sidewalk program that uh, was presented and how many neighborhoods have been able to take advantage of it? Just, you know, really short uh, update on that would be appreciated. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you. And we will move on to the final item, which I hope I can still read. It's getting late. Uh, we have a length of service recognition for Kirby Bartlett, who I understand this is Kirby's last meeting. Kirby, thank you for all of your time and service. I have a certificate of appreciation and recognition of Kirby's numerous contributions to the town of Corte Madera as a member of the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee <clears throat> since March, 2013. Kirby's experiences as both a longtime cyclist and runner has provided him with the tools to effectively evaluate the many multimodal enhancements to the town's infrastructure brought before the committee throughout his tenure. One of Kirby's lasting legacies to the community is the founding of Bike to School Day, which he first organized in East Corte Madera in 2008. He led the event annually from 2008 to 2013, and it now occurs regularly at both of our local schools, elementary schools and middle school. The committee extends its service gratitude for his service to our community. Thanks him for the many pizza dinners he frequently <laughs> eating. <laughs> I got that in there. And wishes him well in his future endeavors. Kirby, you will be missed. Kirby, thank you yeah. so much. 
Well done, Kirby. Um, thank you. That was actually very, very thoughtful and, and sweet. And I really appreciate um, everything you just said there, Bob. And as, as I said in, in my email, you know, I, I did this because I wanted to make a, a difference for commuting bicycles and pedestrians in Cordendera. But um, I've, I've gained a lot of friends along the way, and I really appreciate um, the experience that I've had with all of you. And Kirby, I thought you were going to be here tonight, so I baked some cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry you're not here. I guess we'll just have to take care of them. Too bad. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and just so you know, um, I, I, the job opportunity presented itself, and it was a great opportunity. And I, I told my wife, you know, wow, this is a great opportunity, but it's in Washington, D.C. And she looked at me and she said, so what's holding us back? Um and because our kids, kids are grown, um, you know, one lives in New York, the other was in Chicago for a while. And, and we said, okay, I'd never lived outside the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so giving it a try, but I'm not selling the house in Corte Madera. That is where I will, we will retire. Um, and actually, I'll, I'm going to be there for Thanksgiving and I'll be back again for Christmas and I'll be back in the summer. So you'll, you'll see me around town occasionally. Well done. Kirby, thank you so much for your yeah. service. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate yeah. it.